Uh, okay, let's see how this works. The, um, for example, before deregulation of airlines, I mean, from the 1930s until a couple of years ago, we had the Civil Aeronautics Board, a beloved institution, um, which was put in by the large airlines, United, Pan Am, uh, in the 1930s, to serve as a cartelizing device, in other words, as a monopolizing device. <coughs> The um, CAV was put, it was lobbied for by the big airlines, it was staffed by essentially people from the big airlines. The idea was to keep <coughs> excluded airlines, to, to, to assign monopoly routes, and also to regulate the rate so the rate would keep going up. Um, for example, in New York to Boston, had, I think only Eastern Airlines could do that route in those days. Nobody, if anybody else tried to fly from New York to Boston, they were shot. <laughs> in other words, they were considered illegal. They were excluded by the CAB. The CAB gave certificates of convenience and necessity, I think it was called, to, every, to any airline on any route. The CAB said, no, you can't fly on that route. You couldn't do it. There was, no, there was no free market, in other words, no free enterprise in the airline industry. Uh, I think at one point, Pan Am had the entire Pacific locked up. All routes in the Pacific had to be Pan Am. Nobody else could compete. I think it was only, I forget now which, I think Pan Am was a Republican airline, and, and TWA was the Democratic. I think, um, or vice versa. I think, yeah, I think that's what it is. When Democrats came in, they allowed TWA to fly in that route. So, uh, and uh, there still is, by the way, a very powerful international airline cartel, IATA, the International Airline something Association, Trans Transport Association, something like that, which has a lockup on all the European flights. And those of you who've ever flown to Europe will see that, to your horror, that it's, it's more expensive to fly from. London to Frankfurt, and this would be United States, New York to London, because the, the intra-European intra flights in Europe uh, are locked up by a very, a very powerful intergovernmental cartel, which used to be, which the United States is now finally, has now finally busted, has been busted inside the United States for American Airlines. Um, the, uh, so, the, so in other words, you have a rationing situation. You, you assign routes. You exclude everybody except one or two airlines from each, from each route. Uh, you lock up particularly the major routes, the most profitable routes, and and jack up the price. Now, originally, say in the 19, I think by the, as late as the 1950s, there was no such thing as first class and tourist. All classes were first class. Everything was very was very extremely expensive. What you had then was uh, heroic little airlines. They were, they were names like Transamerica and Continental. Was another uh, Transcontinental. Transcontinental. They were competing, and there were small airlines. Another thing you have to realize, which we'll deal with, emphasize in this course too, a big air, a big company doesn't doesn't necessarily outcompete a small one. Sometimes small competitors are more more efficient. And so, uh, in this case, the small airlines came in. They started outcompeting the big ones by offering cheaper service and a no frill service. This is the days before People's Express. Um, and immediately, the CAB and the behest of the airlines comes in and puts them prohibits them from scheduling their flights. <clears throat> in other words, it says, okay, from now on, you guys, there's no safety problem, by the way. Sa safety is the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, CAB was purely in charge of economic monopoly, um, part of the airline business. And uh, these guys, were, they had a very good safety record, much better than the big airlines per, per mile flown. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but they, CAB, the CAB said, well, you guys are unfair competitors. We won't allow you to schedule your flights. In other words, they couldn't have any timetable. They had to sit there on the on the air on the on the, on the, on the running runway until they filled up. So they could only say, "Well, we're flying on Tuesday." They couldn't say we're flying on Tuesday at 11 a.m. They're prohibited by by the law with the CAB from doing that. Even so, so they were called the non-scheds and the non-scheduled airlines. Even as non-scheds, they were able to outcompete. They were able to fly people from New York to L.A. Let's say for half the price. Of the of United or American or TWA, they were very good. yeah yeah yeah. In fact, how much the consumers are willing to, to go for it. Right, and there was a cut down on the consumer demand, obviously, for so they don't know you can they don't know when you're going to leave in the, during the day, right? But even so, even with a non-sked uh, repression by the CAB, they were still out competing. they doing very well. They were cutting the price literally in half. Fair. Now, it's, it's true there were no frills. Some of these outfits um, used to weigh you along with the, the luggage. There's a, a maximum weight of you plus the luggage. For those of us who are on the heavy set side, we felt it was kind of, kind of discrimination. <laughs> Still, in all, you were paying 
there's a trade-off. In other words, in return for getting for the ignominy of getting weighed, uh, you also, you know, cost you a lot less. Um, I remember my wife flew from Los Angeles to New York on a non I think it was Transamerica, and it was, it was very cheap. It was, it was not, free, it was kind of scary in the sense that they, they said, well, from, uh, at one point they announced, uh, please everybody go to the, the back of the, of the plane. That sort of thing. It didn't, didn't give you a feeling of great confidence. Also, at one point, there was a leak in the plane. It was raining outside. There was a leak in the, in the ceiling of the, of the plane. The stewards were great up plumb, went up there and took a Band-Aid and put it on the <laughs> leak. So it's kind of a raffish, <laughs> a raffish airline. It didn't give you great security. On the other hand, they had a very good safety record. It had no crashes, I remember. And, fi- and they forced, they were the ones, it was the, it was the competition of Transamerica, Transcontinental, that forced the big five to finally create a, a, a coach section along with the first class section, to cut, their, cut their, their fares in the rear of the plane in half. That was in the 1950s. It was them that did it. The heroic battle competition of these little airlines that forced America and United Airlines and, and, and TWA and so forth to, to finally create a second class fare system. Uh, Finally, what the CAB is, they simply put them out of business. They forced them out of business. And from now on, you can't fly anymore. That was the end of that. The end of poor Transamerica and Transcontinental and the rest of it. <clears throat> um, and there was a uh, there was another plane that went to Europe. I forget the airline. Friends of mine used to go on when they were students. They would, they would fly to Iceland and Luxembourg. And it would land in the United States. It would land somewhere in a field in New Hampshire. <laughs> and you make your way to New York <laughs> by train or bus or something. Anyway, it was, again, very cheap. Much cheaper than the, than the official fares in that period. So what happens is, in other words, these planes had minimum, their, their rates were kept up. They were set by the CAB to a very high rate. Uh, also, they, there's all sorts of ways to compete. Now, if you can't compete on the basis of price, you compete on the basis of quality of service, of thrills. And so um, you start giving, you know, more, better, better, Food or uh, swankier uh, portions, prettier stewardesses, and so on. So these became the methods of competition rather than price. Uh, at one point, IATA cracked down and said, uh, "From now on, no more meals, no more hot meals on airline on, 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 on transatlantic flights. You can only have sandwiches. No more hot meals. No more, you know, real dinners." And so, what the individual airlines started to do in order to break the cartel, they started having. Uh, Okay, we're only having sandwiches. They had open face sandwiches. They take the whole you know, beef burger and you and put them on a pipe piece of bread and call it a sandwich. <laughs> so this way, getting around the crazy cartel regulation. <clears throat> so all these it's, it's, uh, economic history, by the way, history of, of government and economy is essentially a history of, of the government versus the market. The government puts on crazy regulations. The market tries to get around it. We've seen with price control and so forth. Same thing is working here with monopoly uh, monopoly uh, privileges. Uh, you put on a regulation, you have to keep the price up. Then, then the airlines start competing in things like, like better meals. Then, you, then the cartel tries to crack down on the meal and say, no, you can only serve sandwiches, and they serve open face sandwiches, or the whole meal on top of a piece of bread and call it a sandwich. That was, <laughs> um, the, uh, <clears throat> what finally began, began to happen with the airlines is they became, if you're a monopoly, you get a very high profit. Okay? But it, eventually, in the long run, the, the profit gets gets competed away and based to higher costs. In other words, what then happens is, in other words, you have a high demand curve, high profits, then increase your demand curve for, for workers, for raw material, for whatever, and the, and the prices start going up. And what, you ha- what happens is you have very high salaries, for example, for pilots and stewardesses, much, for, much higher for these big airlines than anybody else, from the, from the non-scheduled types. Uh, very high costs. Plush offices and great, great enormous amount of inefficiency. You wound up after about 40 years of this with the airlines losing money anyway, even though they were monopolistic, even though they were restricted, and so forth and so on. They're still losing money. This, by the way, was what happened with, with, the, tra- with the trains and, and railroads in general. Uh, railroads were overbuilt. They were then regulated. Their, their fares were kept up. Uh, the f- rates were kept up by the Interstate Commerce Commission. And finally, after many decades of this, they started losing money, even though they were getting privileged by the ICC. Losing money as monopolists, because monopolists tend to get inefficient. And uh, so you wound up with these, these airlines losing money anyway. Uh, and uh, finally, when the move for deregulation came in the, in the late, late years of the Carter administration, 1978, the airlines were almost ready for it. They said, oh, how about it? We'll have, to, we'll have to try something new. And so they more or less went along with it, even though reluctantly, because 
monopoly just wasn't working, finally. Just, they were just losing money anyway. And they began to realize maybe we'd do better under deregulation, even though they weren't happy about it. They were still ready. Their, their love for, for monopoly had more or less withered away after, after 40 years of this. And as a result of deregulation, we have tremendous changes in the airline industry. Some lines have going, went bankrupt. Other lines have popped up as new and uh, effective competitors, like People's Express. We, again, with People's Express, it's much less, it's much cheaper. On the other hand, you have to realize that you know, you're not quite sure when they're going to take off because they might sit there loading up, etc. So, uh, and you realize that, and you see, you're, you're, you pay for the difference. Uh, so, various outfits have been involved. A lot of reshuffling in the airline industry, plus. The invention of the hub and spoke thing, which came about only by market, began to realize it's more efficient to have hub, in, hub cities like Denver, let's say. So instead of having a lot of nonstop flights, say, from New York to Los Angeles, you stop at Denver, you stop at Houston, you have a, a lot of uh, airlines coming in from, from other cities, coming into Denver and going out again. Nobody could, could have predicted in advance this is what would happen. This is, only came about as a result of the market, market forces, where it turned out that this is the most efficient way of doing it. So at any rate, this is, uh, so in the long run, even the monopolists begin to lose out in the situation, but uh, it, it often takes, you know, half a century to do that. 